live today, as well as our panelists. Before I do introductions, I just want to give a little bit of an overview of what to expect in this conversation today and a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the Mental Health Association has been around for more than a century, advocating on behalf of patients and their families for a quality system of mental health and behavioral health care in our state. Um, we're here for a conversation about our state's efforts in making progress towards mental health parity. Uh, we're going to review some background in history about what parity is, the laws that apply, and what that means for patients and providers in our state. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the challenges we've experienced in implementing parity laws and regulations. And we're going to talk about the current crisis that we're facing and the challenges to really achieving the promise um, that we all had hoped for with the passage and implementation of mental health parity laws. This is an event that's part of May is Mental Health Month. Um, and I wanna pay special thanks to sponsors who have um, helped support not only the Mental Health Association, but the dozens and dozens of agencies and service providers across the state who participate in uh, May's Mental Health Month activities and who beyond May continue to be at the forefront of providing services, treatment and advocacy for the people of Rhode Island. Um, if you are interested in uh, learning more about other special events for this month, you can visit the Mental Health Association's website for the full calendar. That is www.mhari.org. Um, and I encourage you all to do that. There's a lot of really good things happening, not just this month, but you can learn about other activities that occur on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis, support groups, um, family support groups, substance use disorder support groups, um, treatment programs that you may not be aware of, and anti-stigma efforts that are going on across the state. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about um, just a little bit of housekeeping for today. Um, if throughout the course of this conversation, you have questions that you'd like to pose to our panels or clarifications that you'd like to have made, don't hesitate to enter. Uh, your question either in the Q&A, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will have a uh, formal question and answer section at the end, um, but don't hesitate to enter questions prior to that as they come up for you um, throughout the course of the conversation. Finally, I want to welcome and thank our panelists um, who are with us today. Um, this group of people really bring a depth of understanding and knowledge on this issue um, to the forefront. Um, first, Marie Gannum. Um, happy to have you here, Marie. She is our former health insurance commissioner who really brought parity to uh, the forefront of the Office of Health Insurance Commissioner's work during her tenure in the office and has um, important information to share about how um, we have historically pursued implementation and regula regulation over insurance companies related to mental health parity laws. So thank you, Marie, for being here. And our, our current health insurance commissioner, Patrick Teig, who has really stepped up the efforts of OHIC in carrying forward their work to address the real challenges that we face in investing in and supporting um, a strong system um, and continuum of care and behavioral health for our state. I wanna welcome Senator Josh Miller, who again has just a historic perspective and an understanding of the current work that needs to be done and future steps we need to take in trying to address the systemic problems that are preventing us from responding appropriately to what we are currently experiencing in terms of the crisis in 
um, behavioral health in our state. So welcome Senator Miller and uh, welcome Representative Tanzi. Teresa Tanzi um, brings a, a real empathy and deep understanding to what patients and providers in our state are experiencing. She and Senator Miller have spearheaded um, legislation currently before our General Assembly to try and um, take steps to remediate some of these challenges. And she's she and Senator Miller, along with Commissioner Teig and former Commissioner Ganim, are real champions on this issue. And last but not least is my co-host, my partner in all of this work, Seamus Dirac, who is the staff attorney at the Rhode Island Parent Information Network and who manages our state's health insurance consumer helpline, bringing valuable support, especially in the arena of trying to get the coverage people are entitled to for their behavioral health care treatment and services. So uh, welcome Seamus, and I am going to turn it over to you. Seamus is gonna give us a little bit of background just to set the stage for our conversation. Great, thanks so much, Karen. And thanks uh, again to Rep Tanzi, to Senator Miller, uh, to Commissioner Tag and former Commissioner Gannon for being here today. Um, this is clearly a, an issue uh, that is uh, incredibly important to so many Rhode Islanders um, and is so important nationwide as well. And it's really great here in Rhode Island that we have uh, such committed uh, advocates throughout both the advocacy community but also the legislature and the Office of the Health Insurance Commissioner to drive this forward. Um, I'm gonna pull up a uh, brief little slide deck to talk a little bit about some of the uh, work that we're doing. And uh, kind of just as Karen said, lay the, the groundwork for what the uh, parity laws that are uh, applicable here in Rhode Island are and um, uh, where that applies and kind of to, to set the stage for uh, where things stand currently, uh, further enforcement efforts, both on the legislative and the regulatory um, sphere. So uh, as Karen mentioned, I work with Ripen. Uh, I work with Ripen's call center. Ripen is a, a nonprofit, a uh, bit over 100 employees that serves Rhode Islanders throughout a variety of uh, both health and education related um, struggles that folks can go through. Um, the call center works specifically to assist Rhode Islanders facing health insurance issues. Um, we are a live answer call center. Folks can call us with regard to any health insurance issue. Um, we work with folks with uh, Medicaid, Medicare, commercial insurance, any variety of, of health insurance. And in that work, uh, we see considerable uh, numbers of, of cases come in of folks having difficulty acting behavioral health. No surprise to many of you on the call today. Um, but that's something that we do provide assistance with. So uh, we're, we're, all, we're available for that, um, but it does give us kind of a window into, into what folks are facing. Now to, to move on to kind of what the, uh, the, the stage is in uh, the parity laws, there are two major laws that, that we're gonna talk about today um, and that kind of provide that, uh, that foundation for what behavioral health parity is. There's a federal law, that's the Paul Wellstone and Pete Domenici Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Um, and that law states that for plans that elect to cover behavioral health and substance use disorder, it requires that those benefits be offered at parity to medical and surgical benefits. It does not require that plans offer behavioral health and substance use disorder, um, but for those plans that do, they must offer it um, at parity. Now, the Rhode Island state parity law goes a bit farther than that. It does require plans to offer behavioral health and substance use disorder services. Um, it prohibits annual and lifetime dollar limits on those services uh, and requires um, some specific services be provided in substance use disorder. But, uh, and this is something that we see across the board with health insurance regulation, uh, state laws regulating health insurance only apply to certain plans. They do not apply to every type of health insurance a Rhode Islander may have. We'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Um, but in addition to the, the, uh, the additional step of requiring coverage of behavioral health and substance use disorder, it also requires that um, medication management, counseling, kind of the, the uh, 
normal routine visits that you would have with a behavioral health specialist be covered the same way that a primary care visit is covered with your PCP um, for cost sharing purposes. So that helps keep uh, costs down for in-network um, behavioral health kind of primary care visits. Now, this is not a, uh, a scientific chart of how people access health insurance in Rhode Island, um, but it's not too far off uh, and kind of lists some of those most common ways. You'll see that a little bit over half of uh, Rhode Islanders access health insurance through an employer. Um, within that, about two thirds of those are self-insured called and the other one third are fully insured. Uh, that generally breaks down to self-insured plans are larger employers, fully insured plans are frequently smaller employers, so that's not a scientific definition, and sometimes there's overlap between those, um, but that gets back down to, to kind of what laws are going to apply. Um, about a quarter of Rhode Islanders are covered by Medicaid, about 20% of Rhode Islanders are covered by Medicare, uh, about 8 to 10% are covered by health source, and about 3% or so remain uninsured. Now, no parity laws apply to Medicare or Medicare Advantage plans. Um, so currently, neither the state nor the federal law requires that uh, Medicare or Medicare Advantage plans cover um, behavioral health at parity. Um, parity does apply to virtually every other type of insurance. Um, but as I mentioned, self-insured plans are, uh, these are largely the larger employer plans. These are exempt from state law, so they're only covered by the federal parity law. That being said, there's a lot of overlap between those laws in, in what uh, parity actually means. Um, and really what that breaks down to is the behavioral health and substance use disorder benefits cannot be more restrictive than other benefits provided under a plan. Um, that applies in three main spheres within a plan. That's financial requirements, which means that a copay, a deductible, a coinsurance amount, um, the annual dollar limits on a plan, which fortunately um, are, have been suspended because of the Affordable Care Act, um, but any of those are not um, allowed to be different or higher for behavioral health services. You can't have a separate behavioral health deductible. You can't have a higher copay for the same service in behavioral health as, as compared to medical and surgical. Same with treatment limits. If you have a treatment limit of X number of physical therapy visits or other sorts of therapy in the medical side, you cannot have a lower limit of treatment on, um, on behavioral health therapy. And really where a lot of the, um, the action is, for lack of a better word now, um, is what are called, it's a mouthful of a word, but non-quantitative treatment limitations. But what these really are, are kind of the ways that a plan is implemented um, that don't break down to a, a number, a, a dollar amount, uh, a number of treatments, um, but just the way that you access your benefits. These are things like medical necessity review. So the way that a, a health insurer determines whether a uh, service is medically necessary cannot be applied more stringently uh, in behavioral health as compared to medical surgical. Drug formulary design, you can't have an open formulary in um, in the medical surgical side, but a very restrictive formulary uh, limiting access to drugs in behavioral health. Fail first policies, you can't have um, more stringent requirements around step therapy for, um, for treatment in behavioral health than you do in medical surgical. And one of the most important ones right now, which is the standards uh, for provider networks. Um, that is the way that that bears out is that um, a provider network cannot be uh, created to be stricter and smaller in behavioral health uh, than it is in medical surgical. Now that has a lot of elements to it. It can be the administrative requirements that a provider has to go through to participate in a network, um, but it can also be things like the reimbursement rates that are paid to providers to incentivize them to join a network um, such that a, a health insurance consumer can act to actually access care within that network. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Karen to start our conversation. Karen, you're muted. I apologize. Um, that's a lot. And for those out there 
participating and viewing this conversation, it can seem very confusing. Um, and that's uh, a challenge. That's one of the challenges that we face in healthcare writ large and in behavioral healthcare more specifically are the complexities around um, how as a nation we have chosen to pay for our um, health delivery system. That said, I really am interested to hear, and I think that um, former Commissioner Ganim and Senator Miller can weigh in significantly on this. What historically spurred passage of not just the federal, but our state parity act, and what have traditionally been um, some of the challenges to implementing and regulating the law in the earlier days? I'm gonna open it up, but I, I think that probably Marie and, and um, Senator Miller have a lot to say about this, given your long history here. Chairman so, Go ahead. sure, Marie needs to um, accept a lot of the credit for the progress on this. If those of you who don't know, before she was health insurance commissioner, she ran Senate policy office. Mm -hmm. And um, for those of you who don't know, elected officials um, put their name on it and then everybody else does all the work, including people like Karen. But um, within the state house, people like Marie do most of the work and we just um, follow along a, a lot of the time. Um, so I wanna thank Marie who continues to be uh, somebody really important to all of this. But there have been challenges both on the federal and the state let on the federal and the state level on parity uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, I'll start with a few and that, then let Marie say um, I'm, that's consistent with what she thinks or add to it. But um, it's really hard to enforce for a lot of reasons. And one of the main reasons it's hard to enforce is uh, the way care gets approved. So there's authorization from the insurance company and uh, that authorization can often be a barrier to getting care. And also, I'm really glad that Seamus put that chart together because we can only enforce a, a small part of that pie chart. Um, it's really hard to enforce unless we require it in MCO contracts, which is a vast majority of our Medicaid population, our contracted um, to insurers. And um, so it's really hard to enforce those unless they're part of the contract that they have to comply with parity um, comprehensively. And then um, on the self-insured side, it's always going to be difficult for state lawmakers um, to enforce on that side. So it leaves us with a smaller window. Um, and then it's hard to navigate in how um, payers, insurers um, kind of dodge and weave around what is required in parity. Marie. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Miller and Representative Tanzi. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. Um, thank you to everybody else who's on the call. The, um, the, the reason that this is so complex is a reflection of our complex healthcare system. So we have <clears throat> so many players, so many different special interests, and unfortunately, or fortunately, so much money in the system, whether it's uh, folks who get their income from the healthcare system or in some other way um, are, are reliant upon uh, the money that flows. And the uh, so when you hear, particularly, I think when we hear Commissioner Tig speak, we'll hear about how um, implementation and how uh, what is being addressed is happening on a number of levels. It's such a complex problem that there's not one solution. There's not one um, piece of legislation that's going to solve it. And just as Senator Miller said, it's complex, even just in terms of what portion of the population is going to be addressed by legislation versus implementation versus the Medicaid program. So unfortunately, the complexity of the healthcare system um, is, uh, is being reflected here. And we have similar access problems for certain other healthcare services, but none of them quite as substantial as I think we have today here in mental health. Um, 
So just to get your original question, Karen, how did this come about? So actually, I go back 40 years um, mm -hmm. with this issue. I was actually on the board of the Mental Health Association exactly 40 years ago and um, had the opportunity to work in the governor's office at the time as we were deinstitutionalizing, de was the term that we used, the population that had been housed in a mental health hospital, the state mental health hospital, which is part of what's Alan Slater Hospital now. We had a robust well-funded, federally funded network of community mental health centers at the time. And <clears throat> what is different today is over those 40 years, we have eroded that coverage. We have eroded the, fu the funds that go to those community mental health centers. And so we went from a system we were proud of where individuals who particularly needed the most intensive services were moved from the institution, supported in the community. There was supportive housing, there was adequate staffing, and we've definitely eroded that system over the past 40 years. So that's one of the problems that we confront. So before that erosion even started taking place, there were a number of laws that passed at the state level in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, one was championed by former um, House HEW Chair Neil Corkery. It had to do with how insurance companies were approving or not approving access to behavioral health care, particularly substance abuse treatment. Just as Senator Miller said, the insurers look at um, benefits, if they were required to provide behavioral health benefits, then they were going to do whatever they could to control the costs and control access to those benefits. So the Utilization Review Act passed. That was very quickly followed just a couple of years later by what was known as the Zania Act. Lieutenant Governor Fogarty was involved in leading that charge, and that had to do with network adequacy. So basically, they were saying to the insurance companies that now that you're going to cover behavioral health services, you need to make sure that people um, are getting access to an adequate network of services. And you cannot, in fact, deny services just be, by not having the right kind of professionals out there. Um, those two laws, utilization review and network adequacy, are now under Commissioner Tig's purview. They had been under the health department. And I know that the office has used those tools to enhance service delivery. And then the last piece, of course, <clears throat> has to do with managed care. So during the time that the insurers were building these networks of care, they also decided that one way they would control their spending would be to decrease the amount of reimbursement to providers. Mm -hmm. So again, this is going back to the 80s and 90s. I know these themes sound very familiar now, but it's what was going on then. So the insurance companies set up these networks, negotiated contracts, and then decreased the amount they were reimbursing to hospitals and to community providers by around 40% at yeah. the time. Um, and they actually were making money. The insurers started to make money off of behavioral services at the time, but look what it's done to to our network of care. So that's just a little bit of the history of that that I think I, I bring. Thank you. That is su such a good um, background to where we are now, because I think, you know, we are in a significant crisis. There's no lack of news um, for legislators to hear, for the public to hear about our increasing rates of substance use disorder, depression, anxiety, um, suicide rates going up, overdose rates going up, and yet our system isn't able to respond. And how over this 40 year period that you've described for us, Marie, um, we've eroded and, and, you know, sort of like, funneled sand away from the, the foundation of a quality system. So I, I'm hoping that, that all, particularly Representative Tansy and Senator Miller, but also you, Com Commissioner Tig, are hearing directly from both patients and providers about the current crisis. Can you give us a sense of how people are experiencing the situation today? and what we are confronting as a state currently. I'll give just a brief recent interaction I had. <clears throat> Excuse me, I was at the seawall the other day down in Narragansett and ran into someone I hadn't seen in a while, struck up a conversation. And within 10 minutes, she was asking me if I knew of a counselor who was accepting patients. And um, 
disclosed, you know, the situation that's ongoing with her family and uh, that she's been searching for weeks now to find someone uh, for a family member. And um, it, it's top of mind for so many of our families. Um, this is someone I hadn't seen in a very long time. And for that to be among the very first things that was brought up, um, that need, that almost desperate feeling of not being able to, um, to help someone who, who needs that help. So um, <clears throat> it was a very interesting background in history. Um, I definitely learned some things there. Uh, Marie, thank you for that. Um, and it's this network adequacy that just keeps falling short. Um, and I'm sure we'll get to talk a lot more about that, but uh, you know, whether you're reading something in the paper about children being held over in the hospital um, because they're unable to be transferred to an appropriate level of service, uh, you know, down to the personal where you're, you're hearing from your friends and your family that there's just a need out there. Yeah. Yeah, right. I think I, I, I would just jump in. Uh, can I, first of all, I'll say again, thank you for having me today. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be with this group and really great for, for everyone's collective efforts. The only thing I, I would add about people's experience, uh, very consistent with what Rep Tansy just said, is that a couple of things. First is I think it's really notable. I'm sure many of us observed over the past uh, several, several, several weeks when we saw um, our state's pediatricians and psychiatrists declare a state of emergency for pediatric behavioral health. I think that tells you something because these are the people in the trenches doing the work, trying to serve families and kids in particular. Um, and if they are telling us that they have reached a point where they want to come forward publicly and make a statement like that, that's not a routine thing. That's not something we see every, every day. Again, the crisis certainly precedes this, as you heard from Marie and Chairperson Miller, that there has really been a true crisis you could characterize for many, many years, far too long. Um, but I think the fact that we're seeing that in the pediatric space now, I think is really important and we all should pay attention to that. And I think many of us are. Uh, it should give us a new urgency in my opinion because that's reflected of people's lived experience. And then the, the second thing I would say on a more personal note, and I would bet this is, uh, I would hope and will, I actually, I'm, I'm sorry it will, but I would imagine that it will resonate with many people, not only on the panel, but also who could be listening today. Um, you know, I'm the dad of a school age, uh, elementary school age daughter. Um, she needed behavioral health services during the COVID-19 public health emergency. And it was extremely hard. And I'm the health insurance commissioner. It was extremely hard to get her the access that she needed. Um, and I took it just because of, you know, the age my daughter is. I talked to a lot of other families in a similar circumstance. And that was not a unique experience. And so even though the behavioral health crisis precedes the COVID-19 uh, pandemic period, it's been laid bare by this and made so much worse. And so again, I think those two factors together add up to me to, we have to have an increased sense of urgency and action around that urgency. And that requires, and it has, we, that's enforcement action, that's policy reform, that's legislative action, um, that's action by private actors. But to me, I think it's really clear that people's concrete experiences personally and professionally are really hitting home to me. And I think to everyone that there really is a crisis here that we have to take action on if we want to see progress. So um, yeah. that's been my experience really in the, in the more recent term. Senator Miller, what about you? You hear, you know, you're chair of the Senate um, Health and Human Services Committee. So you're hearing from people every day about this. So, yeah, I do, not only in the formal setting of a hearing where people come forward, but, you know, like uh, Teresa in your neighborhood. I'm going to give uh, two examples, uh, but before I do, um, in a crisis without adequate network or continuum of care, um, it may surprise you based on what where the context of the last few days, what we're talking about. The most significant piece of legislation I'd like to be identified is not the legalization of marijuana, but it's the uh, codification of the ACA in telemedicine. One of the only ways we were able to increase access to any care was with te telemedicine. So codifying and making indefinite what uh, many of the components that we did um, in telemedicine last year, to me, I bring that up often to people as the most impactful thing we have done to date that, had, that created more access to care. Um, but I'll give two examples. One is, um, is, is redundant to what I hear in committee and uh, also what I hear in my neighborhoods is uh, similar to Patrick, um, is access for children and adolescents mm -hmm. to mental health care. 
and what our system was designed for and what is naturally um, expected when you seek um, a psychologist or a psychiatrist and you end up with either they don't accept your payment because it's too low, right? Mm -hmm. Or the wait is too long. And what both of those things do is create crisis. Mm -hmm. The patient is trying to avoid crisis, but because of the lack of access, crisis is created. And therefore, what traditionally has happened, um, I'm bringing it up sooner than I thought I would, what, what happens is that um, legislative leadership or those who are responsible with um, uh, um, identifying what the fiscal act, uh, impact might be if we, if we pass any legislation like this is um, that it is deemed an increase and therefore fiscally a concern where actually the fiscal concern should be rather than the increase to Medicaid cost is that you are creating a potential for hospitalization, which would be multiple, multiple more expense if you had created a system that created immediate access to the less impactful care. Mm -hmm. Seeing a therapist, a psychologist, or a psychiatrist, rather than the access um, going out to, um, you know, eight months from now when you could have seen that doctor, the crisis occurs instead. And the other very briefly example I'll give has nothing to do with behavioral health. We passed the insulin law, right? The, that limited the cost of insulin. Mm -hmm. Six months later, I get calls directly from patients. Why was my insulin still $500 instead of the $30, co $40 copay? because that patient was, in, in the case that I heard, insured by the state, right? Insured by the state, therefore not part of the law because it wasn't commercial insurance. Mm -hmm. It fell in that self-insured category, which the law isn't allowed to impact. Mm -hmm. And therefore we left 75% of Seamus's pie chart out of that law. So every time we diminish a law to commercial only, or leave out large group, we are changing the impact from that 70% of that pie chart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in listening to Marie's overview of how we've eroded funding into the behavioral health system over 40 years and really gone from having a stellar system to um, being in the crisis we're in today, um, the complexities and the divisions the, the, within our um, coverage system are a significant part of the problem combined with the, the dodging that you've all talked about that payers will use um, in avoiding and try in their efforts to keep costs down. I think one of the things I'd be interested to hear um, well, first of all, let me state that um, there's a, a question here that's applicable to current um, uh, legislative proposals on the table. One of those is to require, and again, this would only apply to a certain part of the marketplace, but given that you brought up the, the um, last year's legislation um, on insulin, Senator Miller, Right now, there are bills that both you and uh, Rep Tansy have put forward that would really address the parity and reimbursement rates that behavioral health providers are being um, paid right now, which are significantly lower than, in many cases, the cost of care, and in many cases, what um, providers on the medical surgical side are paid. What do you both feel is the likelihood of passage on those and um, why that legislation is an important current step in what we can do? And then we can hear from um, Commissioner Tig about some of the stuff his office is trying to do to address this despite the, the fractured um, system of coverage that we have. Um. 
Who wants to go first, Teresa? No, you can go, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I think for the first time, everybody understands the crisis that we're in related to access to care. And uh, we're doing it when there is revenue available. But they're talking about, right now they're talking about, uh, will this indefinitely be available? And so we're putting a long-term burden on by increasing rates by whatever much, right? And going back to my last example, the re reason there's an eight month wait is because only so many psychologists, therapists or, or psychiatrists will um, practice in Rhode Island because the reimbursement rates are so low, mm -hmm. right? And they're so low for, because of that historic analysis about uh, the, and the, and the, um, the confined analysis to, um, without looking at the continuum of what happens if you have a low rate uh, for a certain provider. And so there is a likelihood because there is a lot more understanding. People avoid healthcare like as desperately as they can because of how complex it is. Mm -hmm. But even those people out of it, there's like too much pressure and a window of understanding based on how crisis the situation is that we have. So we may do it, uh, but my concern, and I think our opportunity is more, is, is more, impact, is more extensive than the legislation. That the legislation probably has like a two year window, whether it's either rate setting or our legislation about a two year window before it's impacted. But we have something that we've never had before, which is ARPA funding. Mm -hmm. So we have a responsibility at the same time that we do this type of legislation to sponsor, to, to find the most crisis components to our care um, and fund those so that there is an immediate impact. I'm saying you can have an impact in July, right? Yeah. By, by identifying the most crisis components and saying, we're going to expand. We're going to fund expansion of that service immediately, mm -hmm. and so I think we the crisis is too much to wait two years for either rate setting or our bill to have an impact. Yeah, you have to find, identify, and prioritize for those who are only paying attention for the last few months to agree with you and understand that the crisis components you identified are a priority priority and should be funded immediately, either by increasing a reimbursement rate or building out a facility like a residential care, building that out for more capacity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rep Tansy. Patrick, did you have something? I noticed you took yourself off mute. Oh, sure. I, I can be really, really brief. I was just going to just, I mean, would really just Second, uh, almost everything that's been that's been said by by but I the the kind of fine point I would put out in terms of what you know what is really driving this and how we're here and, and to me it's really goes back to what former Commissioner Gannon said was we we have a structural what I would call a structural inequity in the funding of our behavioral health particularly our community based behavioral health system and our medical care system and to me I think the the most um, this one of a simple way to illustrate that or think of that, there's many ways, but to me is if we can, and, and by the way, it's both federally and state and state based to be, to be clear. But if we think of the way that we as a nation and we as a state have invested in our federally qualified health center system, for instance, which is absolutely, absolutely critical. We have a very, a very high performing community-based system of our FQHCs here. We do not any longer to, to, to former Commissioner Gannon's point, have something equivalent to that, to that type of, it, of investment on the community-based behavioral health side. And to me, that is a result, again, of, of uh, again, multiple, many, over many decades, public policy decisions to not make those same kinds of commensurate investments at the federal and state level. And so the result that that produces is when you have an increasing need, and particularly during the pandemic period where we've seen that absolutely go through the roof, um, again, you combine high need with inadequate capacity derived from inadequate funding, and you produce the solution that we, or rather the situation that we see, which is lack of access. So to me, that's how I fundamentally think of what the status quo, the inadequacy of the, of the 
status quo. And that's why I think, again, we need multiple efforts, multiple levers to redress this. Um, but I do think efforts like what Rep Tanzi and what Chairperson Miller are putting forward are absolutely critical. I am very supportive of those. And I think, uh, but I think Chairperson Miller's point is absolutely spot on as well. It's it's a both and, not an, not an either or. We need to think about any resources we have to make targeted investments to uh, alleviate the kind of need we're seeing now. We need to think about those and make those. Um, so just really just kind of a full throated endorsement of what's been said, but trying to just explain how I think of it and how I frame it as a conceptual approach. You know, uh, Commissioner Tyke, before we go back to Rep Tanzi, um, question has come up, and I think this is really applicable to some of the work that OHIC is doing, which is separate from funding barriers. We also have an issue of credentialing that is inhibiting uh, more um, providers coming into the field. So insurers um, have had a tendency to have more stringent credentialing requirements that would allow providers into their networks. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and whether or not OHIC has the capacity to, to try and address that. Sure, sure. No, it's an important question. And these are, again, this is why I think thinking of us all the, all the different levers we have to, we have, we have to pull. So um, specific to that issue. So we, uh, as I think some people know, we, we are fortunate enough to receive, to have recently received the grant from the federal government, from CMS, that part of which we are using to look at two really core issues in stepping up our behavioral health enforcement and being resourced to do that. One is in uh, collecting data and developing a system for collecting data uh, to assess parity on a more regular basis, not sort of on a retrospective basis, but in a more real time, so maybe twice annually or, or, or even more, inclusive of things like reimbursement, et cetera. So that's one area. But the other area that's directly germane to your question, Karen, is looking at network adequacy and how we can, OIC already has authority in the network adequacy area through our network plan statute and regulation that was transferred to us a few years ago, as was noted earlier. Earlier. Um, I think now is the time where we're going to use these, these funds partially to evaluate this and then move forward with rulemaking to reflect this, that we need more specific, rigorous standards in behavioral health specific. I think particularly children's behavioral health for all the reasons we've talked about, but in behavioral health broadly, that really holds our payers accountable for both not only having an adequate network, but also getting into things that that regulation covers like credentialing um, mm -hmm. to make sure that and I would always distinguish in this whole conversation, parity is absolutely critical, right? That is a baseline compliance obligation that we have to enforce rigorously, but we wanna make sure that there is parity, but we also wanna make sure that there is, so once we've established parity or in parallel to it, is there sufficient access? Because it may require going beyond parity to make sure that we have to have the access that people, that people need. So to me, my message kind of about that is parity is necessary, but it's not necessarily sufficient to get the outcomes of that that we need. I think on the regular on the regulation side, there may be many, there may be some areas where there is compliance with parity, but that doesn't mean our work is done. And I'm I feel really fortunate that OHIC does have the statutory authority to go beyond parity and actually make sure we are supporting an insurance system and therefore a healthcare and delivery system that actually fosters access and outcomes. And so I, I think we got to think we have to think about this in that in that holistic way. So I don't want to monopolize. I want to give Rep Tanzi a chance to jump in here too, Karen. But thank you for the for the question. Yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> it's I'm trying to think of what it's going to take because for years we have been saying this is a crisis because it was a crisis. And now we've hit a new depth. And I, I don't know if it's a loss of productivity in the workplace that's going to resonate with leadership in order to make this um, a priority that they are in, compelled to act on. Um, but I, I think, you know, we have some data. It's not the most updated data. Um, you know, uh, Commissioner Tighe's office is working uh, very diligently to give us more data. But, um, you know, I'm my greatest fear right now is that we're going to get through this legislative session, which will probably end in six weeks without having, you know, even put a drop in the bucket. Um, so even if we, you know, Senator Miller was saying that if we pass the, the parity or the rate review, that's going to be two years before we make a difference. And, um, you know, I, 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 my biggest concern right now is that we don't have the time um, in order to do that. And our, our most basic responsibility as a government 
is to be the ones who catch people and mm -hmm. to be the ones who, you know, create this environment where we can support these folks um, who are in desperate need. And I, I think we're failing. Um, and, and if we walk out of this session without doing uh, something significant on an emergency basis, you know, you can all give us Fs on our report cards because um, we have failed not only in our jobs, but we failed the individuals who live in our state. Um, <clears throat> and it's not just our responsibility. Um, I, 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 I think it's the insurer's responsibility as well. There's been a game that's been played for far too long that talks about a network that doesn't exist. You know, I heard someone refer to it as a ghost network, and that's wholly yeah. true. Um, and, you know, they're failing in their responsibility as well. Um, we've got an opaque system that people can hide behind. And I hope that we're tearing off those, um, you know, those those blinders so that we can actually see what is going on um, uh, and make real educated uh, decisions as to where we need to put our energies. But, um, you know, I'm I'm at a loss at this point as to what we can do to convince that that, uh, you know, leadership and um, the governor's office that the House really is on fire and we have to act now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that advocates are doing all they can. I also think it's interesting, the, the in, intersection of some of our most significant issues before the assembly this year around access to affordable housing and support, supportive housing and community care and the crisis we're facing in behavioral health care, they are so intermeshed. Um, I have a question, and this is an interesting perspective, and maybe this is something, Marie, you could sort of talk a little bit about. I have a question in the Q&A about how we can ensure providers are complying with parity law. Um, there are providers that are refusing to take referrals based on a client's insurance. And I think understanding, um, you can bring some perspective to understand it, that parity laws apply primarily to insurers and payers and not providers and the complexity of that underlies why providers have traditionally chosen not to engage in in payer um, networks All right, thanks karen you're exactly right the parity act just as senator miller was explaining that when they pass a state law it only applies to certain populations because there are only certain populations that the state regulates or has the authority to regulate. <clears throat> so the same thing is true of the Parity Act, both at the state level and at the federal level, it only applies to commercial insurers. And therefore it's limited to insurers, not to providers. So, but what I wanted to, I follow up a little bit on uh, Representative Tansy's, um, which I think was a great plea for uh, where we are right now and for the, the assistance that's needed, but is to not necessarily treat every insurer the same <clears throat> and to not necessarily paint them all with the same brushstroke. Now that I'm not the commissioner anymore, I can be freer to say that there is really a distinction uh, between uh, and among some of the insurers that operate in our state. Um, I don't have to name names. You can just look at the history. Um, in the past couple of years, uh, OHIC has issued a number of reports. One was just this past week, I think, Commissioner Tag. Um, and you can clearly see that the processes that are in place with some insurers are much more restrictive than with others. So I think it's an opportunity to find the good actors. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a for instance, in 2018, OHIC had done a study of Blue Cross Blue Shield's practices relative to people accessing behavioral health services. And Blue Cross was looking at the same cases we were looking at at the same time we were looking at them and noticed what they were doing that was impeding access. They themselves, Blue Cross, agreed with the office that they would stop doing some of the behaviors that were getting in the way of people accessing services. One of those is called utilization review or management, and that they would, in, in effect, kind of trust providers, trust the provider's uh, opinion as to whether or not someone needed care. And they would work then on those cases directly with the providers. The sky has not fallen. Providers are making decisions without having to respond constantly um, to the questions of the insurer. I believe that that's working. 
Um, it, it's not a panacea, but what it shows is that the insurers can be partners with the legislature, with the administration uh, to come up with solutions that can have a little bit more immediate response. Yeah. I want to, we are at, uh, I want to do a time check. We are at 1220. We have a number of questions in the Q&A. It's really time for us to transition to more specific questions from um, today's attendees. Um, I want to, you know, and in, in, in one hour, we can't cover it all. There's so much work happening legislatively and via um, the Office of Health Insurance Commissioner that we haven't had time to go into detail about. Um, and so a future conversation is warranted, but I wanna get to some of these questions. Um, in the, the Q&A, Ruthie Fetter, who is the former executive director at the Mental Health Association asks, what is the impact, if any, that the recent, and I think Commissioner Tyke, this is probably one for you, that the recent WIT case reversal, um, it, that was WIT v um, United Healthcare, um, that found them significantly out of compliance with mental health parity. Um, and that case was reversed on appeal. What impact could that potentially, that reversal have here in Rhode Island? Yeah, that would, thanks for the, for the question. Um, so it, obviously that was incredibly disappointing to see that, that reversal, I think across the country, it was widely recognized as being such a profound setback for advancing mental health parity more broadly. Um, I would say that the, Although I think everyone recognizes uh, that there's a steep hill, hill to climb, that that process is not over legally. Um, I would really applaud Attorney General Nerona. I, 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 he, as I, I think probably many people know, filed um, a brief with a range of other states uh, to try to seek for a rehearing of that um, because of the impact, the, the, the negative impact that's hearing. So I think that that's really important action. So the legal, I would just say certainly the, the reversal is really problematic, but um, I think there is still hope that we can pursue that legally as a, as a country, as well as, as a state and see if we can get to a better outcome. But in terms of the, the, more, the more specific question, um, some, some people may have observed that for conduct um, of United Healthcare that was very, very uh, closely related to, to the WIC case, um, our office did fine, independent of the WIC case, we fined United, United Healthcare for that conduct. And even after WIC, uh, was reversed, United still complied and paid the fine. And the reason for that is not only because we had a regulatory action in place, we had a consent agreement with them that, that required them, but the reason we were able to do that is we did not rely on the WIC case for that. We relied on state law. And that is why, to me, the importance of having both federal protections, but also having state protections. Chairperson Miller mentioned earlier the importance last session of enshrining them, you know, many of the Affordable Care Act rules and requirements in state law, it really does matter what the rules are here in Rhode Island, because my position on that issue, and it continues to be, um, there are some legal observers that um, have some concern that there is risk to state laws even coming out of WIT, but my position here as the regulator is that payers here in Rhode Island are required to follow Rhode Island state law, period, regardless of, um, until there's a federal court case that, that specifically would preempt our state laws, our position is that we're going to continue to enforce those those uh, those those laws, regardless of the outcome of WIT. So I think we have to pursue WIT on a federal level through the legal process, but also it's the importance of continuing to have strong state statute and strong state protections that we can enforce here in Rhode Island. Yeah, um, I there's there's a statement here from an anonymous attendee that I'm going to read aloud because I think it really. It really gets at what these issues can mean for people. And this person states, I have a 29 year old daughter for whom I struggled to get the behavioral health support and care she needed from the age of 11, resulting in hospitalization and out of state residential treatment. She now lives at the state hospital after a stint at the ACI. There is nothing in Rhode Island at this time that adequately meets her unique needs. Just today in the Providence Journal, there was an article about um, wait lists at Bradley Hospital and children being held um, for long waits at Hasbro. This gets at all of what we've been talking about. 
and it gets to Senator Miller's statement that we need some, in addition to the longer term uh, structural changes in payment and reimbursement and parity that need to happen, but the immediate need that Senator Miller and Rep Tansy talked about in terms of investment that we'll see quick turnaround on this. Um, we have another um, attendee who talked about um, their child being unable to receive services from multiple providers and being told that those providers can only take state insurance. I'm assuming in state insurance, you're talking about Medicaid. I'm not sure, uh, Laura, exactly what that means, but how can we change this so children can receive intensive services even if they don't have state insurance? This might be for Seamus to address. Sure, um, and it's it's a difficult question. Um, and I think it really gets down to a couple of, of the things that we've talked about so far. One um, is really the access within a network is that these networks are so spread thinly. Um, and I mean, this is the rejoinder I think that we've come to at the end of pretty much every question we've talked about so far today, which is that um, because of years of underinvestment, um, there are less providers available both within and outside of the health insurance system. Um, but for those who have the, the funds to, to pay separately, sometimes there's a little bit more. For folks that are dependent on accessing coverage through their insurance, um, there's frequently very little. And so that is going to require a rebalancing of kind of how we build those networks. And I think that's a really crucial part of both the work that Rep Tanzi and uh, Chairman Miller are working on legislatively, um, but also as Commissioner Tig has articulated a lot of the, uh, the work um, that OHIC has laid out for the future. And so we're, we're appreciative of that, but it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot to undo the decades of underinvestment that have resulted in the, the care con like continuum that exists currently. Um, another one is around access to coverage. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that our uh, organization works very closely with. Um, but something to keep in mind is that we are in a, a period uh, anticipating significant disruption around that. And um, that kind of goes across many different things. There's, there's access to uh, health insurance that exists currently under the Affordable Care Act um, that despite a decade plus of implementation and successful defenses against uh, threats to the Affordable Care Act, um, those threats are not going away. Um, so I'll, I'll step slightly outside of the world of behavioral health care to again, thank uh, Chairman Miller and uh, our partners in the house on um, advancing work to protect the Affordable Care Act in Rhode Island to ensure folks have access to coverage. Um, but also we know that, that there remain a lot of threats to the affordability of coverage, um, to uh, work that needs to be done on the federal level to ensure the extension of, of financial support um, that could expire in the very near future for people who really cannot afford to lose their coverage. Um, these oh. are ended, uh, premium tax credits um, under, under ARPA. Um, and Senator Miller, do you have something you wanted to jump in on there? I just wanted to say that um, going back to um, you know good or bad players in insurance, they seem to all be unanimous either publicly or privately that they don't like codifying the ACA and um, they they constantly talk about it with leadership because if the Supreme Court does something to it, they want the opportunity to offer crappy insurance that might not include any of the ten ten essential benefits or some of them. And that has headway. It still does have headway. And that's why it hasn't passed. And um, I just wanted to give a ray of hope on a couple of things also is that uh, um, that uh, I did have conversations about um, uh, continuum of care it's directly to the Q&A you read, Karen, on um, that people are finally understanding that there are not every setting that we could um, take advantage of and that we desperately need. And so there is a ray of hope that there is an understanding and I do see at least some of what would be 
everybody's priority of funding some of those residential settings that we all think are so important that might meet those needs. Yeah, and you know, like um, there's a statement in here from Carolyn James at Kodak. And um, she talks about how Kodak not only treats substance use disorder, um, and it, which includes tobacco cessation treatment as um, well as other substance use disorders, uh, but that they are also a behavioral health provider. Substance use disorder is a big piece of that. Um, and she mentions how important adequate reimbursement is. Um, Senator Miller, you, I'm, and I'm gonna make this quick, but you did um, facilitate a um, commission that really looked at payment structures and the impact of um, our structure on payment and what that means. And Kodak did an excellent presentation that demonstrated they actually lose money in providing care. And I think that gets at some of what Marie was talking about in terms of the erosion of, of funding and investment, not only by insurers in the form of claims that are paid, but also investment by the state and federal government outside of healthcare claims and reimbursements um, that are uh, community-based mental health, um, community mental health centers and um, nonprofit agencies like Kodak need in order to keep their doors open and um, provide the services that we all need. It's, there's a lot of work to do. We can't cover it all. We are at time. I wanna thank, I, and if you asked a question, I apologize that it wasn't answered. We have run out of time, forgetting at everything. But I wanna very much thank all of our panelists. This was an amazing conversation. I think it warrants us coming back together maybe after the end of the legislative session to do a follow-up. Um, there's so much work that's been happening via OHIC that we didn't have a chance to touch on. I encourage people to sign up for OHIC's newsletter. I encourage people to contact um, the Rhode Island Parent Information Helpline um, if you are currently facing challenges with your own coverage. Seamus, do you want to give the phone number again? Sure thing, and I'll put it in the chat and we can circulate that to the attendees as well. But our number is 401-270-0101. You can follow the prompts and get connected with a specialist you can help. And if you believe you have been the victim of a parity violation by your own insurer, uh, OHIC has updated their website. They have a brand new website with a very prominent button for patients and consumers to click if they uh, feel as though they're not getting to where they need to get with their insurer. And you can visit their site. Commissioner, do you want to give the website address? Sure. It, it is ohicohic.ri.gov. Very simple. And as, as uh, we, we really tried to improve and make that uh, consumer and provider complaint uh, functionality better and easier, and that, and that really is the, the best way. We will follow up with you on that and take action. So please use that liberally if anyone feels they can use assistance from the office. Absolutely. And I would be remiss to not uh, let people know that we have an amazing array of educational um, and community information resources um, via both www.mhari.org, but also the Rhode Island Parity Initiative, which includes um, video, educational videos and materials in both Spanish and English at www.riparity.org. Um, we had a question early on about is there, are there resource materials that can help connect people to services? The Mental Health Association does have a very good um, um, resource pamphlet um, I will uh, send that to uh, Seamus and Mark at Rhode Island Parent Information Network so they can email that out with the follow-up to this um, uh, conversation. And we're beyond time now. So again, thank you to all. We appreciate your participation. Um, please support the work that Rep Tansy and Senator Miller are doing on the legislative front. Stay tuned with the work of the of OHIC and reach out if you need help. Thank you so much. Thank you all.